so good to see you guys. Come on, let's pray. God, we just we want to thank you that in your presence, we find everything that we need. And God, even when we don't come with our best, your best covers us to the point where you only see your son, God. And so God, today I pray for that. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would cover those things that we're afraid to expose, that you would heal those things that are broken. And God, today I pray for every word that's spoken to be of you, Holy Spirit. And whatever's of you, God, I pray that it would land and bear fruit. And if there's anything not of you, let it fall to the ground. God, we pray that you would lead us and guide us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. So you can grab your seats. How good has this cooler weather been over the last few days? Thank you, Jesus, for a little bit of coolness and rain. It has been brutal. Ethan went on his very first ever, Ethan, my son, for those of you who don't know, he went on his first ever tour. It was a rugby tour. And Cheryl said to him when he leaves, you have to come back. You can lose other things, but you have to, you have to bring your sleeping bag back. Because the sleeping bag is dad's sleeping bag, and I've had that since I was at school. It is a very decent sleeping bag. It has survived stuff. So Cheryl said to him, you've just got to make sure you bring the sleeping bag back. And he, was, he listened to that. He brought the sleeping bag back. He didn't bring his shoes back, his socks back, his cap back. His, his, his gum guard, which I don't know how you lose your gum guard. He didn't bring his gum guard. So he was true to what Cheryl said. He brought the sleeping bag back, but there was a whole bunch of other things that never came back. And so we're praying for the prodigal to return. The prodigal gum guard, the prodigal whatever it is to return. We're very excited about the miracles that God's going to do with his shoes as well. Um, but it's so exciting. Uh, again, can I encourage you? Make sure you're here next week, Good Friday, uh, Resurrection Sunday. We've got incredible stuff in store. Two experiences with Pastor Jim Cantalon on Friday and three experiences on Resurrection Sunday. And Pastor DJ is gonna be preaching on that day. So you'd not wanna miss any part of that. Today, we are talking about Palm Sunday. Anyone here grew up in a more traditional church where you actually made the crosses out of the palm leaves? Anyone here? Throw your hands up so I know. Okay, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, what used to happen, and I grew up Anglican, Catholic, all kinds of things, is you would go to church on Palm Sunday and you, you would get like a strip of one of the leaves and you would fold it in a very specific way that it would become a cross. And, and it was really, uh, it was a whole thing. And so if you have grown up in a more traditional church, you've probably been in some... Uh, really beautiful or significant Palm Sunday experiences. And so today we're gonna dive into that. We're gonna dive into that moment where Jesus had the triumphal entry and he entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. But before we get into that story, I wanna ask a, a question is that, have you ever encountered a crisis or a moment where things got really heated and something came out of you that you didn't know was in you? Ever have that happen to you? Right, you considered yourself a peaceful person. And then someone did something to you and you gave them the fivefold ministry in the love of Jesus, right? Maybe not, maybe it's just me. Anyway, but some, sometimes stuff comes out, right? And you had no idea it was in there until you encountered something, a crisis or something, and what was in you, what was right at the bottom, buried deep, 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 all of a sudden came to the surface. Ever had one of those moments? I, as a follower of Jesus, do my best not to swear or use profanities. I really believe that that has been repressed and all it takes is one taxi to cut in front of me. And it was like these things, these words are stuck in the Velcro in the back of my mind. It's like, boop, boop, and the stuff comes out. And it's like that, right? It's, you think these things are not part of you, that you think some of these things will never, and then all it takes is one significant moment where everything that's in you spills out. And we don't just experience the top of the calm water, we experience the dregs that were settled at the bottom. And often it's crisis, often it's, it's all these things. And, and maybe you've seen someone where that's happened. Maybe it's you where that happened to you. And, and you wouldn't have considered yourself an anxious person, but because of the crisis, you became anxious. And I think what so often happens is that these tests, these trials, these crises, they don't make us into something we weren't before. They just reveal what we've been really good at bearing. And so that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today is, is what got revealed in Jesus 
Not what got revealed in the people, but what, did, what came out of Jesus when he stepped into the Holy Week? Because for us, we talk about the triumphal entry and it sounds great. Yeah, Jesus being worshiped. But think about it from Jesus' perspective for a moment. He knew that on the other side of him going into Jerusalem was the cross. So for him, this, this Sunday, this Palm Sunday, this triumphal entry, while we're like, yes, he gets worshiped, Jesus knows if I step foot in Jerusalem, I'm tying myself to the destiny of the cross. And so this is, yay, rah, rah on everyone else. But for Jesus, I wonder how he faced what was going on in his heart and mind as he rode on that donkey into Jerusalem because he knew from this point on, I can only ever go to the cross. The cross can only be my destiny the moment I step foot into Jerusalem. And so I wonder what was going through him. I wonder what came out. And, and today we're gonna have a look and there's so much more that we could say about what comes out of Jesus during Holy Week. But we're just gonna focus on Palm Sunday. Uh, for those of you who've never read your Bible, Palm Sunday is actually mentioned in all four gospels. Uh, Matthew and Mark are like word for word copies. Um, Matthew obviously copied Mark and... Uh, <laughs> I just, you, we know Mark was first. That's all I'm saying, okay? And so Matthew and Mark are like word for word copies. Did you ever give anyone homework at school and be like, just change a couple of words? And then they didn't? That's kind of like Matthew. Um, and then John comes along. John gives a very unique angle on the gospels. And so his, his take on, on Palm Sunday is quite unique. Luke kind of also is similar to Matthew and Mark, but he gives a slightly different angle. And so we're gonna camp in Luke today. If you've got your Bibles with me, you can go to Luke chapter 19, verse 29. And again, we're gonna read this narrative, this, this moment of crisis where Jesus stands on the precipice of the cross. And we're gonna see what comes out of him. And so in verse, nine, uh, in verse 29, it says this, when he, Jesus, drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, Bethany is the, where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived, his good friends. At the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you. Everyone say, in front of you. Where on entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. I love the language here. Jesus says to his disciples, go into the city that's in front of you. Why do we need to understand? Why is the language portrayed in such a way? And again, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three have this phrase. Why does God feel the need? Why does Jesus feel the need to say to his disciples, go into the city that's in front of you? That's not, don't go to another city. Go to the one that's right in front of you. Why, what, is that, what does this show about what comes out of Jesus when he's faced with a crisis? What does this reveal to us about Jesus? Well, I don't know about you, but there are some times when there's something right in front of me. There's an issue, there's a, a situation, and I know that that situation is not a good situation. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be nice. And so instead of stepping into the city that's right in front of me, I go and explore every other possible city. Anyone else like that? We become great explorers when we want to avoid what's right in front of us. We, I don't know about you, but I have the ability to turn avoidance into a spiritual gift. Yeah, procrastination right up there. So let's just do a quick show of hands, right? When you know you've got to do something you don't want to do, how many of you procrastinate? How many of you, okay, thank you procrastinators. How many of you just stick your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist? Never mind procrastinate, you're like, this, ex this just doesn't exist. There is no city. How many of you, like me, just avoid it by keeping yourself busy with everything and anything but the issue at hand? You become really good at everything you've been promising to do for years. Yet Jesus, when he was faced with a city that none of us would wanna go into, he says, I'm going straight in. Many of us, we know that scenario, right? You know you've gotta have a conversation with your spouse. 
You know it's gonna be awkward, you know it's gonna be difficult, you know that there's gonna be tears, and so you become really good at washing the clothes. <laughs> you become very, very intentional about doing homework with your kids. Because what I wanna do is I wanna visit every other city other than the one I know I have to step into. What about when you know you've gotta have, have, a, have a hard decision when it comes to your finances? You know you're in debt, and you know you need to make some hard lifestyle decisions. You know you have to make some hard decisions about what to not do, how to, what to sell. You may have to downscale your house. You may have to sell your cars, and you know you've got to step into this process because if you don't, you're gonna drown in debt. You know you've got to step into the city, but instead, takealot.com. I'm going for retail therapy. It's amazing how good we are at not stepping into the city in front of us. It's amazing how many excuses, how many alternatives, it's amazing how many other strategies we have developed as human beings to not do what we don't wanna do, even though we know we have to. I get a sense that there are some here, especially in this experience today, where you know you've gotta go see a doctor. There's that thing that you've been ignoring or there's that thing that your spouse has been saying you need to go to the doctor and you've been avoiding it, you've been ignoring it. You kind of go to the city of we don't have enough time or you go to the city where we don't have enough money but you know at some point you have to step into the doctor's rooms. And this is tough, right? Because we all know the feeling of not wanting to step into that city because we know that we know that that city is awkward or uncomfortable or there's a painful journey on the other side of our stepping foot in that city. But when Jesus was faced with a city that none of us can even comprehend, when he was faced with a scenario that none of us would wanna step foot in, he doesn't go left, right, he doesn't excuse, he doesn't stick his head in the sand, he says, go right in. And so what comes out of Jesus when he's confronted with crisis is this resolve that nothing can break. It's this courage that nothing can quench. It's this conviction that I'm making this decision not because it's easy or because I have a warped view of it. I know exactly what it means, but I'm stepping in anyway. And so the very thing that comes out of Jesus when he's confronted with crisis and conflict is this idea that he cannot be shaken. The second thing he says in this passage is that find me a cult that no one has sat on. A cult, for those of you who, like me, had to do a bit of research, a cult is just a young donkey. A young donkey. Any of you ever driven through Botswana? There are donkeys everywhere. But here's a donkey, and they go and find a young donkey that no one has ever ridden on, it's young. And Jesus, they put the cloaks on, and Jesus climbs on the back, and, and they ride the donkey into Jerusalem. And, and many of you may know this, Zechariah 9 verse 9 is a prophecy that Jesus would enter Jerusalem or the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on the back of the donkey. And so what's happening here is Jesus is fulfilling the prophetic, but what he's also doing is he's making a massive declaration. If a king, any king entered a city on the back of a horse, he was declaring war. He was saying, I've come to conquer, I've come to claim, this horse is my steed of battle and I'm coming in and I'm going to take. I'm gonna conquer. But if a king was coming into a city that someone, that, that, that he wasn't gonna conquer, that he wasn't coming to wage war on, a king would often enter into a city on the back of a donkey. And so what Jesus was saying is, I have come to bring peace. I've come to bring peace. Now, this, this may not resonate with you, but this resonates with me because when conflict happens, psychologists tell us that every human being tends to have one of two responses. I hate those. You know when someone says there's two kinds of people in the world? I'll be like, and I'm the third. Don't put me in your box. But psychologists will say to us that every single human being on the planet, when you're faced with conflict, you will either fight or flight. Fight or flight, right? Our dominant posture is either to fight or to run away. It's either to engage or to disengage. 
And, and when I say flight, I don't just mean run away. For some of us, flight looks like disconnecting emotionally. It looks like just being, being there physically, but not being there mentally and emotionally. So sometimes we, we flee, not physically, but emotionally and mentally. And so psychologists will tell us there are two dominant responses. There are two responses to differing degrees that all of us have, fight or flight. I am a fighter. My father nailed it into me when I was very young that a man's job is to stand and fight. And I, like, I, I'm, all, I'm, I'm, that, I'm the guy who, man, if something comes up, you better have an exit strategy because I don't. <laughs> but here's Jesus coming into a city and, and all of Israel, all the Jews of the time, they were praying. They were hoping, they were trusting that what was gonna come to save them was a Messiah who would enter the same way David did. You see, when David enters the story of Israel, all of Israel's hiding from Goliath and David fights the battle. David comes as a warrior to fight on behalf of a nation that was oppressed. And now Israel, Judah are under the oppression of Rome. And so what they're saying is when we are oppressed again, what we need is a new David. We need a warrior. We need someone who can take down this Goliath we call Rome. And so what they were hoping for was a warrior. What they got was a peacemaker. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Not peacekeepers, peacemakers. And I don't know about you, but this is tough, right? Some of the toughest teachings of Jesus are where he tells us to not fight. Turn the other cheek. Is that so I can get a better swing, Jesus? Like, like are you teaching me how to use my hips? Like, what, what, what? Those are hard teachings, right? I remember a little while ago, I, was, I had a bit of a conflict with someone and they had said things, I had said things and it had got very negative, very tense. And we, we'd organized this meeting to kind of sort it all out, to clear the air, but I wasn't anticipating a good meeting. I was super frustrated. And I don't know if anyone else does this, this is my defect, but before I go into a tense meeting, I'm working out all the strategies. Right, how many of you do this? You work out every possible thing that person could say and you come up with the best answers you could. Anyone like that or is it just me? Okay, thank you for your honesty. The rest of you, how do you do that? How do you not prepare? Anyway, so in my head, I'm like, I'm preparing, right? This is my strategy. Here's my offense. Here's my defense. And I don't know about you, but any meeting like that I go into, I like to have a couple of nuclear bombs in my back pocket that if they seem to be winning, I'm like, whoppa. And so that's my strategy, right? And I'm going through all of this in my head and I'm getting my defense and my offense ready. I've got my nuclear bombs ready. And I remember about two days, 48 hours before the meeting, I remember Holy Spirit just dropping into my heart. He says, you've been doing a lot of time preparing your arguments, but you haven't spent any time preparing your heart. I don't know about you, but there are times I'm like, Jesus, that's not fair. Like you're God, like I'm, I'm just me. Like that's, that, you can't be chucking stuff like that at me. That's not okay. But as you do, when God start, kind of talks to you like that, I just kept quiet. I was like, okay. And he said, you've been really focused on how you're gonna fight this person and you haven't given any thought to how you're gonna love this person. You wanna fight well because you wanna win, Mark. Yes. <laughs> that would be great. But you haven't given any time to how you're gonna love this person well. And I wish I could say after that day, I've never had that happen to me again, but I'm still, I still fall into that place where let me figure out my arguments. And again, Holy Spirit will just gently remind me, are you gonna love them well? Because when Jesus steps into a situation, he's not worried about fighting or flighting. He's not asking the question, who am I gonna conquer or how can I have, an, what's my exit strategy? He doesn't look at either of those. He, 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 he plows a new path and he goes, how can I bring peace to this situation? And I wonder how many of us here in this room, we're facing a fight or flight moment. We're going, it's either that or that. I either destroy or I walk away. I either come out the winner or I walk away. And I wonder if Jesus is asking us, hey, I love that you're seeing this in that way, but might you want to see it in a different way? Might you wanna ask yourself, how can I bring peace to a situation? 
that you're trying so desperately to conquer or to run away from. Because what comes out of Jesus is not fleeing, it's not fighting, it's peace in the midst of conflict. Let's read the, the, the last part of this. Verse 35 to 40, it says this. And they brought it, the colt, to Jesus. Throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Matthew, Mark, uh, sorry, John talks about how they put the palms on the road. And the palms signified victory. That's why we call it Palm Sunday because when everyone saw Jesus entering, they saw him coming as a conquering, victorious king. So they put the palm branches, the palm branches were a symbol of victory. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples. Please don't think for a second Jesus only had 12. There was a whole group that followed him. Began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, this is an interesting portion for me. Because when you read it in the context of Matthew, Mark, and John, as well as Luke, you read that the things they declared as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem were things like, hail conquering king, here comes the son of David. And it's amazing how they overlooked the fact that he was coming on a donkey. They didn't even see the donkey. They were still looking for a conquering king. They were saying, here comes Jesus. He's gonna fix it. He's gonna conquer. He's the king who's gonna save us. Rome, your time is up. Here comes the son of David. Goliath, you are coming down. And sometimes it's amazing how we worship what we think God is, not who God really is. Sometimes we come into the presence of God and we shout, we exclaim, we worship our version of who we want Jesus to be, not who Jesus really is. And I wish I could say, man, we are so far removed from this, but don't you, isn't it true that all of us, if you expect something, you see it. We tend to experience what we expect. There was a study done a little while ago where a whole bunch of women um, were brought into a room and they were told, you're gonna spend hours in a cosmetics chair and we're gonna make you look uh, disfigured. We're gonna, through makeup, we're gonna make it look like you've been uh, hurt or injured. We're gonna make it look like you were born with some kind of defect. And then straight from the chair, they were taken into an interview room where they were interviewing for a job. And they were asked, once they came out, give us feedback on what you felt during the interview. Now, they were taken straight from the chair into the interview and back to the debrief. At no point did they see what they looked like. And so they walked into the interview room, and every single one that came out said that they were prejudiced against. They pointed to words or phrases, and they said, that person who was interviewing us was prejudiced because of how we looked. Every single woman that came out said that what they experienced was prejudiced because of how they looked. And then they were shown how they look. And not one of those women was in any way disfigured. In fact, what they had done is make them look even more beautiful than the way they'd come in. And so what that experiment was showing is that we tend to experience what we expect. We tend to experience what we expect. And that's sometimes the way we come to God. We come to God and we expect God to do X, Y, and Z because I want X, Y, and Z. And God's bigger than that. God's so much bigger than our small expectations. We need to come with faith, but let's not box God in. Let's not place God in this tiny, small box and God's like, is that it? Even worse, let's not come with the wrong version of Jesus. But you know what I love? That may have come out of the people in this moment, but what comes out of Jesus? The Pharisees come and they rebuke Jesus and they say, Jesus, tell your disciples to keep quiet. And his response is, Pharisees, I agree with you. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't go, you're right, let me teach them the correct theology. 
He doesn't say, okay, let me, let me just, before we keep going, let me explain to them what it means that I'm riding on a donkey. Let's, let's, let's all get on the same page. He doesn't say that. He doesn't correct their broken worship. Instead, he says, even their broken worship is valuable. Because if they kept quiet, if there was a vacuum of praise from humanity, even the stones would cry out. Think about what that means. Even our worst attempts at worship are still better than our silence. Even the most broken version of me, when I step into the presence of God, even when I don't have it all together, Jesus still looks on it and says, well done. Thank you for bringing your praise. Thank you for bringing your worship. You may not have studied, you may not have got all the words, all the things together, but the fact that you are declaring my praises is far better than keeping quiet. And the reason is because you and I were made to worship. We were made to glorify God. And even in our brokenness, in our shattered pieces, our worship is still more in line with our purpose than when we keep quiet. And I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel so broken and I'm like, how can a holy, righteous, just God accept my broken pieces? How can this worship be in any way what glorifies Him? He is so good. How does this in any way glorify Him? And Jesus looks down and He goes, I'll take it. I'll take it. And again, the question we're asking is, what comes out of Jesus? Well, when he's confronted with broken, dysfunctional people doing their best to worship him, what comes out is love and appreciation for their worship. What comes out of Jesus in this moment where people are, are doing their best but fall so far short, what comes out of Jesus is love and admiration for what they're doing. And this speaks to me so profoundly because sometimes all we have is broken worship. Sometimes all I have is a broken sacrifice. Sometimes all I have is less than my best. And it's so beautiful that when I feel like I am nothing, when I feel like all I've got is this broken version and I'm so far from reaching God, He says, man, I love you right where you're at. And I'll meet you where you're at. And Holy Spirit comes and he, Jesus calls him our comforter, our parakletos. And we stand because he stands in us. And he stands for us when we can't stand ourselves. And our worship is not based on our strength, but on his. And this is beautiful because as I mentioned, we can talk about so much that comes out of Jesus during Holy Week. But these three things on Palm Sunday, when we would be terrified Jesus steps in with courage. When we wanna fight or flight, Jesus steps in with peace. And when all we have is broken praise, He steps in with love. I wanna illustrate this visually for you. So I'm not, Nathan, if you wouldn't join me. Aaron, come join me up on stage real quick. And Pastor Ronald, just to add some eldership weight here on the stage. Because this is not just for the young adults, this is for every generation. I'm just gonna ask you three gents just to all sit on the front of the stage here. I haven't prepared them at all, so this is gonna go, this is, see how this goes. <laughs> Maybe we should have stuck with the young adults, I don't know. <laughs> so here's, here's why this is important, right? Because what comes out of Jesus covers what comes out of us. See, when we're in a place where we're like, Jesus, there's no way I'm tackling this. This is too hard. This is too tough. I don't have the strength. I don't have the energy. I don't have the courage. I'm too scared. There's no way I'm stepping into the city that's in front of me. Jesus comes and says, let me cover you with my courage. When we say, Jesus, it's going down. He's either limping away or I am. Jesus, this is, this, is, this is it. It's either fight or flight now. I'm either running or I'm running into them. Jesus, let me cover you with my peace. And then finally, when we're like, Jesus, all I've got in my brokenness, 
I've got a, almost a dysfunctional praise, Jesus. I don't know if what I've got is worthy of You. It's all I've got, it's broken. It's, it feels worthless out of my mouth. And Jesus says, well, in your brokenness, let me cover you with my love. And so here's the thing, right? As much as Pastor Ronald's doing his best Mary impression right now, I back you. Our next nativity play. But when we are most discouraged with what's coming out of us, Jesus is most committed to covering you. When we are most discouraged. In other words, when we come to God and say, God, I cannot believe how scared I am. Or God, I cannot believe how angry I am. Oh God, I cannot believe how broken I am. And we see anger, fear, whatever it is, when we see that in the mirror, Jesus says, come, let me cover you. Because what flows from me flows over you. What flows from me flows to and through you. And here's the amazing thing, right? Here is the most beautiful part of this. When we accept the covering, we can extend the covering. And so it's not just you that Winning right now, we twins. Winning. So you might know someone who's also dealing with anger, and you come alongside and you say, "Let me extend the covering." You might say, "Hey, I know you're dealing with frustration. I know you're dealing with fear about that city that's in front of you. Let me cover you, because what's covered me can cover you as well." You might be broken, and you might know people who haven't stepped foot in church because they think they are too broken and too bruised for a holy God to ever accept them. I wanna encourage you to say, hey, I wanna extend the covering that has covered me to cover your brokenness. Thanks, James, if you can just leave the, the coverings on the stage. Can we give them a round of applause? What comes out of Jesus covers us. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I wanted to say, but I just really want, I think it's time for us to lean in this moment.